Jellyfish are truly alien. Formless and translucent, they have no head, no heart, no brain. They have flourished on this planet for over 600 million years. But they are as mysterious as the great ocean depths. Magnificent assassins, they can kill in seconds and invade en masse. Dangerous jellyfish occur everywhere, absolutely everywhere. And yet, these terrifying creatures could also be our salvation. Unlocking the secrets of cancer, aging, and genetic disease. And in astonishing new research, scientists have discovered that these primeval creatures may even hold the promise of eternal life. Most of Queensland looks like a tropical paradise. But appearances can be deceptive. Here, a quick dip in the ocean can cost you your life. For here lurks a creature more stealthy, more deadly than any mere shark or crocodile. The most venomous animal in the world. This is the domain of the box jellyfish, Chironex fleckeri, also known as the sea wasp. Its tentacles are nearly 10 feet long, with enough venom to kill dozens of people in minutes. The slightest brush with Chironex triggers instant, unbearable pain. Lisa Ann Gershwin is a world-renowned expert on Chironex stings and their prevention. When Chironex stings human skin, millions and millions and millions of little tiny droplets of venom go into the skin, and they travel through the bloodstream, and very, very quickly, they do their damage. When on the attack, Chironex wraps its tentacles around a swimmer's legs. If you're lucky, you walk away from your encounter scarred for life. If you're unlucky, you don't walk away at all. The killer has already claimed over 70 victims. Death happens very quickly, often in about two to three minutes. And it's amazing because it's the only thing we know of in the natural world that stops the heart in a contracted state. These deadly jellyfish lurk near the beaches of Northern Australia between November and May, just when the tourist season is at its peak. Risking one's life for a dip in the ocean is not what most tourists have in mind. Parts of the beach are closed off by protective nets, which the Chironex cannot penetrate. And in case of an attack, lifeguards stand ready to administer emergency treatment. Okay, so with the first aid, the first thing we would do, of course, is uh, douse the stung area with vinegar. And of course, vinegar doesn't stop what's already envenomated into the skin. But what it does do is it neutralizes the cells that are still in the, still in the upper layers of the skin and on the tentacles. Because if we don't neutralize those, what can happen is if somebody was to rub or move that, that tentacle around, they could be stung even worse. The name Chironex actually comes from Cairo, which is hand, because they have these hands on each of the four corners, and the tentacles come from each of the fingers of the hand. And nex meaning death or deadly. So it's basically the hand of death, which is a fantastic name for the deadliest animal on earth. Chironex fleckeri is named after Dr. Hugo Flecker, 
who first identified the species after it killed a five-year-old boy in the summer of 1955. Once the killer had come to light, biologists at Melbourne's Commonwealth Serum Laboratory set about creating an antivenom. They injected rabbits with small doses of venom until they became immunized and then isolated the antibodies. The resulting antivenom can save lives, but only if it arrives in time. I've heard people say, oh, it's okay, if I get stung, I'll just get the antivenom. But they don't realize that it takes minutes, some number of minutes, to deliver the antivenom to the patient and for the antivenom to go through the body so it can work. But the time of death is two to three minutes. So if it takes 15 minutes to get the antivenom and you're dead in two minutes, you can't rely on the antivenom. You have to actually prevent the sting. Chironex isn't intentionally aggressive towards humans. In fact, it tends to avoid contact with interlopers. But its long tentacles can't differentiate between swimmers and prey animals. I think that the venom is probably so powerful because Chironex itself is a very delicate animal and it catches fast fish and big crabs and things like that. So it needs to stop them instantly. Not only is its toxin super deadly, Chironex has a remarkable delivery system. Its tentacles are covered with millions of venom-filled capsules called nematocysts, each only a few thousands of an inch long. Nematocysts are truly one of nature's wonders. And if we look closely at how the nematocysts really function in order to catch a prey, then they seem even more marvelous. The nematocysts have extremely sensitive hairs which stick out from the surface. At the slightest contact, they launch a tiny harpoon, which pierces the flesh and delivers the poison directly into the victim's bloodstream. This discharge process is one of the fastest in nature. In order really to analyze it, you need a very high-speed camera, which is capable of taking around several million pictures per second. A fragment of living tentacle is placed under a high-resolution microscope, and an electrode is attached. artificially triggering the nematocyst to action. For the first time, this high-tech camera makes it possible to measure the speed at which the nematocysts are released. We have discovered that the critical phase of discharge, the release of the harpoons, happens in an incredibly short time, just 600 nanoseconds. In other words, in just 600 billionths of a second, millions of tiny harpoons will lay siege on their target. That means that within this tiny time frame, they attain phenomenal acceleration. An acceleration roughly in the order of 5 million Gs. 5 million Gs means 5 million times the Earth's gravity. That's over 100 times the acceleration of a bullet traveling down the barrel of a rifle. This enormous acceleration is necessary because the mass of the capsules is infinitesimal. This tiny mass must be projected incredibly fast in order to produce a sufficient impact at the point where the harpoons hit their prey. Faced with such a powerful bombardment, there's no chance for escape. Once the prey has been paralyzed, tentacles carry it to the jellyfish's mouth, where it is digested in the gastric cavity. 
a simple pocket which serves as a stomach. Each adult box jellyfish has over 5 billion nematocysts. And no one wants them rubbing up against any more innocent victims. To that end, Australian authorities are trying to gain a better understanding of Chironek's behavior. Scientist Matt Gordon and Teresa Corrette are carrying out a study to help predict when and where killer jellyfish are likely to strike. Chironex flacroi is a coastal species. Rarely do you find them more than a couple of hundred metres from the coastline. And more specifically, it's sort of those shallow, sandy, nice, calm beaches that people themselves want to go and swim at that the box jellyfish seem to like the most. To carry out their research, the scientists have no choice but to swim with the enemy. They are wearing diving suits that are thick enough to block the stings, but you can never be too careful. So what we've got here is the ultrasonic tag that we're going to glue onto the box jellyfish. They're only about 17 millimetres long and weigh less than a gram. So we have tags now that are small enough and light enough that they don't influence the way the box jellyfish is behaving. Now they just have to catch a jellyfish. Since Chironexes are practically transparent, this is no easy feat. When the scientists see one, they have to act fast. Chironex's yep, yep, yep. body isn't poisonous. As long as they avoid any contact with the tentacles, the scientists can manipulate these killers with their bare hands. Teresa, you right with that one? In fact, they prefer to take the risk of not wearing gloves, because if a bit of tentacle became stuck to the glove, they could accidentally touch their faces and sting themselves. The transmitter is fixed using surgical glue, which instantly adheres to the jellyfish's gelatinous body. That tag will then send out a signal for the next 24, 36 hours and allow us to follow it around, plot its position each hour. Once we've done that, we can look at developing a computer model that'll take things such as wave height or wind speed and direction and be able to predict where we're going to find jellyfish. And using that, we can identify where the hotspots are likely to be along the coastline and hopefully better warn the lifeguards. But it may take years to build that kind of an early warning system. In the meantime, the physical barrier of the safety nets keeps the box jellyfish out. But some poisonous drifters have a way of sneaking in. If you've tried more than once to quit smoking, you know it's a challenge that's not for sprinters. If only you could manage to stay on that quitting road, discover prescription Chantix. The Chantix approach is twofold, a non-nicotine pill with a program. The pill helps keep nicotine from reaching key receptors in the brain. It can effectively reduce that urge to smoke. And should you slip up, keep trying. Reach out for support. Tell your doctor which medicines you're taking, as they may work differently when you quit smoking. Chantix dosing may be different if you have kidney problems. Side effects may include nausea, trouble sleeping, changes in dreaming, constipation, gas, and vomiting. Studies show 44% were able to quit at the end of 12 weeks. So talk to your doctor about Chantix. It's all about getting there. There's one person who won't be hitting the beach today. For Sue Braywood, it holds some terrible memories. Um, we were holidaying in, in Port Douglas, and it had been quite a hot day, so we went down to the beach. We swam in the Stinger enclosure because we felt that that was a safe place to be. And I felt like a, a bite on my lower arm, just like an insect bite. And um, stood up out of the water and had a look, couldn't see anything, so got back down into the water to swim. 20 minutes later, 
the full impact of the sting hit her like a freight train. With the pain, it just felt like every muscle in your body was just in a really severe cramp. Um, then I got, then the stomach cramp started, uh, chest pain, and then um, quite profuse vomiting. This is all in the space of two or three minutes. Uh, and profuse sweating, you could actually just see the sweat dripping off me. It's like when, you, when you're in labour having a baby and you, you're in that, you reach the peak of a contraction, that absolute peak where you just don't feel that you can do that anymore, the pain's just too much, that's the minimum that that pain is at and it just builds from there. Sue had been stung, not by a Chironex, but by a monster so tiny it literally slipped through the net. It is known as the Irukandji. The jellyfish was only identified in 1961, thanks to the perseverance of a doctor named Jack Barnes. After every reported case of Irukandji syndrome, Barnes immediately went to the place where the accident occurred and spent hours paddling around in the shallows, looking for the perpetrator. He had few clues. He just knew it had to be small and transparent, since none of the victims had ever been able to see their attacker. Then one day, Barnes captured a tiny jellyfish. To see if it was the culprit, Barnes used himself as a guinea pig. He rubbed its tentacles against his arm. A few minutes later, he was racked in intense pain and had to be rushed to the hospital. He had finally identified the jellyfish responsible for Irokanji syndrome. It was named Karukia Barnesi, after the man who took such an extraordinary risk to bring this little fiend to the attention of the Western world. We've been documenting Irukandji stings since 1943, but the Irukandji people, the Irukandji Aboriginal tribe, actually knew about Irukandji stings long before 1943. They didn't know that it was a jellyfish, but they knew that if you went in the water in the summertime, you'd get sick. They didn't know why, but it's actually because of that knowledge that the name Irukandji was given to the syndrome itself. Sue was lucky enough to survive her encounter with the Irukandji, but the terrible side effects endure. So previously to being stung, I'd been working full time. And even now, two years later, I, I can still only um, maintain part time work, mainly because of the, um, the fatigue, the ongoing fatigue. Yeah. The fact is, we have no idea why the venom acts on humans the way that it does. But it's an absolutely amazing syndrome that it causes in the human body. Absolutely devastating. There is still no antivenom, nor any other truly effective treatment for Irukandji syndrome. The symptoms can last just a few hours, or persevere, as in Sue's case, for many years. The sting is rarely fatal, but when two tourists died in 2002, authorities were galvanized to find a way to protect swimmers. The nets are highly effective against the Coronex flackeri, but of course they have their little friends, the Irukandji, can be, you know, as small as your thumbnail. Now the mesh itself is uh, one inch, about yay big in size. We can't do it any finer, based on uh, the sand and such. It uh, builds up on top of the net and would, of course, rip it and tear it, make it useless. The only thing to do is to try to detect the Irukandjis before they detect us. Emily's doing a drag. We do it three times a day as a minimum. Sometimes they can do it even up to 16 times in a day. The reasons why we do it is to detect whether there are any jellyfish or any tentacles in the water and close the beach before anyone can get stuck. looking in the bucket is because um, we need to look for the animals carefully because they're clear and they're small and we use the white because we can see their shadows onto the white. A team from James Cook University 
sets out at night to hunt for Irukandji. In order to devise an anti-venom, or simply to understand how the venom acts on the human body, they need to capture and study a number of animals. The artificial light makes the jellyfish easier to see and even seems to attract them. Ugo, can you please bring him the bowl? Tonight, all kinds of marine organisms are lured in, but for the moment, not a single Irukandji. What's this? This is a hydra. Ah, this is a yeah, 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 you raise a hydra. This one, and the one in the bottom, it's not a box, really. It's also a little bit toxic, but it will never kill you. Oh, I think I got one. Wow. Oh, yeah, it's an Irukanji. It's very dangerous. It produces Irukanji syndrome. After several hours, they managed to finally find just one. Unfortunately, they're better at finding us than we are at finding them. Back in the laboratory, there's a plan underway to produce Irukanji antivenom artificially. The idea is to use cloning technology to generate large quantities of venom, from which anti-venom could be easily derived. But until this technology is perfected, no one is safe from Irukandji or any other stinging jellyfish that may be floating our way. A lot of people think of jellyfish as maybe only an Australian problem or maybe only in the tropics or whatever. People have their own notions of where the jellyfish are. But the reality is dangerous jellyfish occur everywhere, absolutely everywhere. You know the saying, all great ideas come from somewhere? Not sure who coined it, but it makes you want to say, way to go, Captain Obvious. It does raise an interesting question, though. What happens to that great idea between there and here? Massive quantities of raw material, mixed, melted, molded, sifted, spun, sliced, wrapped, stacked, and shipped. How it's made. All new season, all new episodes, Fridays at 9. So far, over a thousand different jellyfish species have been identified, but it's believed there are many more as yet unnamed. Not all are dangerous to humans. The smallest are microscopic. The biggest are giants over six feet in diameter whose tentacles can reach 70 feet in length. The family of jellyfish includes astonishing diversity of sizes, shapes, and behaviors. They can be found living near the sea surface or in the depths, in the tropics or in the icy waters of the Arctic. Jellyfish don't mate. Rather, males release spermatozoids which float in the currents. Some encounter female egg cells and fertilize them. The fertilized egg develops into an elongated larva, which attaches to a rock and continues to develop until it becomes a minuscule organism called a polyp. The polyp and the jellyfish are so unlike that for a long time, naturalists thought they belonged to entirely different species. What are we looking at right now is a polyp. These polyps are very small, they're like about two or three millimeters long. They have a, a central mouth surrounded by tentacles, which they use for catching prey. These, these animals are, are predators, they're carnivores, they feed on zooplankton. Over the next few weeks, the polyp feeds as much as possible, gobbling up anything that comes in reach of its venomous tentacles. Once the polyp has gathered enough energy, an extraordinary metamorphosis takes place. The upper part of the polyp splits into segments, 
and turns into a little column of tiny baby jellyfish, known as a fiery. It's what we call strobulation. It's a very unique type of asexual reproduction and metamorphosis. We can see this young medusa are pulsating and that pulsation helps young medusa to get released. All the Ephiri liberated by a single polyp are clones, absolutely, totally identical twins. In just a few weeks, they will reach adulthood and be ready to reproduce in their turn. After the fiery got released from one polyp, that polyp can just grow tentacles again and stay as, as it is, or develop more polyp by sexual reproduction. And actually, those polyps are going to be able to stribulate next season, next year. So from one polyp, you can have many polyps that can also stribulate. The tiny polyps fixed to the seabed go on secretly multiplying. But if the conditions are favorable, they may start to produce jellyfish simultaneously. Thousands of them can be born all at once. The scene is set for a jellyfish invasion. And that's just what happened in the Gulf of Mexico in the summer of 2000. In a few weeks, some 10 million jellyfish of an unidentified species suddenly invaded the southern coast of the United States. Every year we get jellyfish and, you know, and people complain about jellyfish and getting stung by jellyfish. So when somebody comes to us and says, oh, there are blooms of jellyfish, um, you know, we, that's, that's fairly normal. You know, we're not, we're not too, too concerned with being very reactive to that. But this strange invader was of a totally unrecognizable species. And then somebody started coming in and, and describing how these animals had spots on them. Then one person brought one in to us and we saw it. And I said, where are these animals? And they said, well, they're right offshore, you know, within, within two miles. And we went out and there they were, vast fields of, of these very bizarre animals. The jellyfish were quite large and covered in white spots. Fortunately, they were not dangerous to humans, but identifying the species proved to be a real conundrum. It looked like an Australian spotted jelly known as Phyloriza punctata, only it was bigger and a lighter color. In his research, Monty discovered there had been invasions of spotted jellyfish in other parts of the world. They had been found in the Mediterranean, Brazil, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico. But each time it appeared, the jellyfish had modified its size and color, adapting to the environment in which it found itself. So if this was the Australian spotted jelly, how had it managed to travel halfway around the world? Perhaps it used a mode of transport often favored by invasive species hitching a free ride. It's been shown for quite a long time that international shipping can translocate animals around the world. One way is by taking in ballast water. They take in ballast water from one area in order to balance the boat. They drop it in another area and whatever is in that water gets you know, moved along wherever the ship is going. And there have been numerous examples of, of animals that have invaded and become pests that were translocated by, by shipping. In the case of Phyloriza, sp Australian spotted jellyfish, is thought that they infested the sides of boats, in other words, hull fouling, and they were brought to another place, and that was the way they were translocated. But 10 million jellies didn't all stow away on the same boat. Probably only a few individuals were transported in this way. And then, once they had reached their destination, may have started to reproduce feverishly. And where they'll stop, no one knows for sure. 
you've tried more than once to quit smoking, you know it's a challenge that's not for sprinters. If only you could manage to stay on that quitting road. Discover prescription Chantix. The Chantix approach is twofold. A non-nicotine pill with a program. The pill helps keep nicotine from reaching key receptors in the brain. It can effectively reduce that urge to smoke. And should you slip up, keep trying. Reach out for support. Tell your doctor which medicines you're taking, as they may work differently when you quit smoking. Chantix dosing may be different if you have kidney problems. Side effects may include nausea, trouble sleeping, changes in dreaming, constipation, gas, and vomiting. Studies show 44% were able to quit at the end of 12 weeks. So talk to your doctor about Chantix. It's all about getting there. This Norwegian fjord seems to possess an unearthly sense of tranquility. But beneath the surface, the waters are seething. A jellyfish known as Periphyla has taken over. Periphyla can live for over 30 years. Here they have multiplied to the exclusion of everything else. Once there was a thriving community of marine life in these waters. Today, it is no more. The only people who come here to fish anymore are research scientists. Their nets still come up full, but only with jellyfish. Jellyfish are invading all over the world. The Baltic, the Black Sea, Australia, the Bering Sea, the waters of South Africa have all been under attack. Professor Fernando Buero has been monitoring Mediterranean jellyfish populations and is convinced of a major ecological upheaval. Over the last 20 years, these proliferations have increased considerably. You could say that where once we had oceans of fish, we're now getting to a situation where they've become what you could call jellyfish oceans, which obviously is a great source of concern to the authorities and indeed to everybody else, including the general public, because the jellyfish are not only bad for the tourist trade, they're also damaging to the fishing industry. In Japan, fishermen are used to jellyfish. But the latest invasions have reached unprecedented numbers. Their nets are swamped by tens of millions of giant jellies, weighing as much as 330 pounds apiece. It is thought that overfishing is partially to blame. When fish are removed from the ocean, jellies take over their food supply, and the population expands. Making matters worse, these growing hordes eat fish eggs and fry depleting fish populations still further. We humans prey heavily on fish. We take them out of their natural environment, and in so doing, we take out the jellyfish's predators and competitors at the same time. As a result, the jellyfish have the field left completely open to them. They proliferate freely because they no longer have any rivals. This is a vicious circle. Both humans and the jellyfish fight against the fish, and this leaves more and more space available for these very ancient creatures. They're taking possession of the world's oceans once more, just as they did when they were alone over 600 million years ago. This increase in the jellyfish populations means a reduction in marine biodiversity. The more fish we take from the ocean, the farther the jellyfish kingdom will expand. And one day, all the world's oceans could come to look like this. Every year, hundreds of dead jellyfish wash up on the beaches of Brittany in northern France. But there is one positive side to this population explosion. These people just aren't clearing the beaches for the tourist. They're after a precious substance hidden within the jellyfish. Collagen is a complex protein which makes up one third of our body tissues. It's like a cement which binds together all the different kinds of cells. Collagen composes 75% of our skin. 
Once harvested, the jellyfish are washed, then mashed up. After a long purification process, fibers of pure collagen can be extracted. 100 pounds of jellyfish will yield less than an ounce of this precious substance. In man, there are at least 13 different types of collagen. There's a particular type of collagen protein which we find in jellyfish and which has the same characteristics as human collagen. That's why we are now using collagen extracted from jellyfish to fight rheumatoid arthritis because it seems to provoke fewer allergies. Also, that means that the risk of rejection is lower than with collagen derived from bovines. There are many potential uses for collagen. It can be used in medical treatments, to reinforce joint cartilage or even in cataract surgery, since collagen is one of the principal components of the eye. Collagen is also used in beauty treatments, since it is the safest and most natural product available for filling out wrinkles. But something better could be swimming along soon, because there is a tiny jellyfish living in the Mediterranean which could well possess the secret of eternal youth. The Turritopsis is only a fraction of an inch in diameter, yet it is capable of a feat quite unique in the whole of the animal kingdom. What is so special about this jellyfish is its ability to overturn a fundamental principle of biology, which says that life works in one direction only, that is, from birth through to death. This jellyfish is capable, at least for a brief period of its life, of going backwards in the life cycle, passing from the stage of adult to an earlier stage, that of the polyp. If an adult turritopsis lacks food, or if the sea temperature drops, the jellyfish lets itself fall to the bottom of the sea, as if it were dead. There, a total metamorphosis begins. The creature's organs and muscles disappear, and in a few hours, its whole body melts until it is no more than a pile of indistinguishable cells. Then, this shapeless mass begins to reorganize itself, little by little. Branching limbs start to grow and give birth in a few hours to a new polyp. This is a truly extraordinary phenomenon. It's as if there were a butterfly capable of reversing its life cycle, of going backwards and turning itself into a caterpillar again. By inversing the normal course of its life, the jellyfish gets younger. In theory, the process can repeat itself indefinitely, making the Turritopsis virtually immortal. What is probably most extraordinary in the transformation of the jellyfish into a polyp is the change that the cells of the jellyfish can undergo. Normally, a cell develops for a particular function, is destined for a precise form, and must only perform this one function. But what happens instead for the cells of the jellyfish which undergoes this metamorphosis is that the cells are capable of de-differentiating themselves. That's to say, of losing the specific function they had acquired and recovering the ability to engender new types of cells, almost as an embryo does. A muscle cell from the jellyfish could, for example, transform itself into a nerve cell in a new polyp, a feat that completely contradicts the traditional rules of biology. This ability of an adult cell to unwind and become an altogether different type of cell makes it a sort of stem cell, the holy grail for researchers around the world. Hypothetically, these cells could be used to replenish old and damaged tissue and may hold the cure for diseases like Parkinson's, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. One of Turritops' close relatives may also open up new possibilities for stem cell research. The hydra belongs to the same family as the jellyfish, but never leaves the polyp stage. This creature has an exceptional ability to regenerate itself. Cut one in half, and it will form two new completely functional polyps in a matter of days. Eight hours in, the piece of polyp begins to reorganize its tissues. 
After 32 hours, tentacles begin to grow. And after 72 hours, the polyp recovers its initial form. It's fascinating because this same tissue, which before was part of a trunk, now develops a foot on one side of the cut and a head on the other. Even more astonishing, when the hydras are mashed up into a soup of cells, they can still reform into a whole and perfectly viable polyp within a few days. It's quite impossible to perform this type of experiment with any other organism which has a nervous system. The genes that make it possible for the polyp to reform itself still exist in human DNA, but they are inactive. It means that in theory, humans could activate the ability to regrow themselves. Of course, it would be marvelous if we could succeed in learning from the process of regeneration in these simple systems and so improve the capacity of more complex systems to regenerate themselves. In practical terms, the aim would be to improve the process of tissue and cell regeneration in mammals, in humans. Research on the regenerative gene could lead to a new avenue of stem cell research, one that doesn't rely on human embryos. But regeneration isn't the jellyfish's only dazzling contribution to genetic science. In addition to their regenerative properties, jellyfish have revolutionized medical research with another mysterious property, the ability to create light. It is not known why, perhaps to attract prey, repel predators, or even to communicate with each other. In the 1960s, American biologist Osamu Shimomura started to look more closely at this phenomenon. He studied one particular little jellyfish called Ikoria, which produces a faint green light. What he discovered proved to be a radical new tool for scientists which allows them to light up and study the cells and structures that interest them in every living thing. What Osamu Shimomura was interested in was what was the chemical that allowed the jellyfish to make this light? Ultimately, he identified a protein called GFP, or green fluorescent protein. Marty Chalfi heard about GFP in 1988 and knew it could help his research on worms. The nice thing about this animal is it's transparent and you can see all the cells in it. Well, if we were able to light up a particular cell, shine, have the cell make green fluorescent protein, shine blue or ultraviolet light on the animal, we could have that cell shine back at us. So we were very, I was very excited about the idea that one could put into an animal a way of inherently marking every cell. Marty Chalfie and his colleagues started by putting light into the simplest of all living organisms, bacteria. In the months that followed, Marty and his team managed to create the first fluorescent worms. This is a picture of a worm in which we've allowed GFP to be made only in the muscles. So we see all of the muscles along the entire length of the animal. If we look at a larger close-up of this, we can see the individual muscle cells and see how they're nicely lined up with one another as we would go down the length of the animal. The jellyfish fluorescent protein is now a standard tool in medical research responsible for scores of major breakthroughs in the study of cell behavior and human disease. The main advantage is that you can use this to look at processes in living cells and in living organisms. You can watch it happening. 
and this has been a real change because previous to this, this wasn't available. You had to use fixed or prepared samples in ways that you were looking basically at a snapshot. Now we could look at the entire movie. Here, GFP has been incorporated into cancer cells in a laboratory mouse. The fluorescence makes it possible to follow in real time the path they take in the bloodstream to better understand how cancer spreads. Besides their fluorescent green skin, these laboratory mice are quite normal. GFP is totally harmless and doesn't alter their biological processes in any way. And for variety, these mice are now available in red, since the scientists have discovered variants of GFP which glow in different colors. And where there's an opportunity, there's a market. The fluorescent gene has now been used to create a range of glowing pets, like these Taiwanese-made fish, which are all the rage in Asia. The humble jellyfish, it seems, has spawned a whole new revolution in genetics. From their primeval beginnings at the dawn of animal life on the planet, jellyfish have haunted our seas. At once our enemy and our benefactor, only one thing's for sure. These bizarre creatures seem destined to rule our planet's oceans for eons to come. Are they primitive? They've made it this far. <laughs> so, so we might think of jellyfish as being very primitive animals, but I might argue back that they're not so primitive after all. They've made it just as far as we have, and they've done it pretty well. I don't think they're primitive at all. <laughs>